Thank you very much. Uh, so today I'll talk about some relation with uh, EN algebras and, and vertex models from uh, statistical mechanics. And I want to start with uh, stating two conjectures, which are due to Maxim. Uh, one of them is about quantum field theory, and it is kind of imprecise just because we don't have a definition of quantum field theory. But the other one is a discrete version of this, and which is very precise, and we actually, I, I, I also suggest a proof of it. So um, the first conjecture has to do with quantum field theory. And um, so assume we're given a, a definition of what a quantum field theory is. So let's start with a, uh, a QFT on some flat space RD uh, uh, with translation and dilation symmetry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, well, I'll stick with D for the moment, but uh, sure. Uh, um, with translation and, and dilatation, dilatation symmetries. Uh, like, and uh, let's say, like, let's say that in this definition of a quantum field theory, there would be some, uh, vector bundle of fields on the on our or space so so with a vector bundle of fields let's say v then the conjecture says that um, uh, translation invariant forms with values in V gets an action of the d-dimensional little disk upright. Yeah, I think you can actually drop this. Yeah. So it is true, yeah. So <coughs> let me make a bunch of remarks. Okay, so uh, first of all, like if uh, like we were we're working with complexes, which is the case here. So if we're in the category of complexes over a field of characteristic zero, and uh, if like we have an E and algebra in complexes, then uh, a shifted by n minus one uh, is going to be a Lie or uh, is an L infinity algebra, and presumably, I mean, uh, or like that's part of the conjecture that uh, this L infinity structure should be related to the combinatorics of Kohn-Kramer, uh, like renormalization. So that's the first remark. A second re remark is that actually, uh, like part of this has been proven in some work of, uh, let's say Costello, uh, Costello with Owen Gulliam. Uh, maybe also by some physicists like Stefan Ollens. Uh, but all this work, they actually deal with uh, theories which are very close to uh, free theories. So only for uh, uh, the perturbative setting. And in principle, I mean, the, 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 like the conjecture should be true for, for deformations of, of theories which are not free. Uh, so I'm sorry, can I just say, is it the I mean, is the property or a structure so that the, that the get the section? I mean, is it something that you just need? I mean, is the structure, do you need to just define a section or is there something you have to check so that to check that we get? Something to check, construct. Yeah, you, you have to construct an, an interesting ED structure on, on this, yes. So you really have to construct it. So it's not, it's not a matter of checking. It's not, 
No, it should come from, let's say, some, some kind of operator product expansion. But uh, yeah, you have, to, you have to construct this ED structure, the, the action of the ED operator. It's not, it's not something that you have, and you have to check that it satisfies the axiom. You really have to construct it. Um, yeah, and the th third thing is that there's a kind of interpretation of this in terms of deformation theory. So there is this, this slogan, which is now a theorem, that uh, uh, formal deformation problems are equivalent to uh, DGD algebras or, infinity or L infinity algebras uh, as infinity categories. And the fact that we would have a, so the, this translation invariant of forms with value in, a, in, a, in the bundle of fields, this should be the, like up to some shift, this should be the tangently algebra of some formal deformation problem. So deformation problem of this translation uh, invariant QFTs. And uh, the fact that there's an ED structure means that this deformation problem should be, should actually lead to some EN deformation problem. So, So this should lift to uh, like some ED deformation problem uh, according to what uh, Lurie actually proved. So Lurie proved that like formal modular problems parameterized by commutative algebras are equivalent to Lie algebras. And formal modular problems parameterized by ED algebras, which are kind of uh, um, well, these are commutative, but not quite commutative al algebras, let's say, are also uh, equivalent to ED algebras with some shift. Okay. So I think there's also some recent work of uh, Chris Elliott and Pavel Safranov about, so th there's some results saying that if you have a factorization algebra uh, uh, with translation symmetries, if you're taking, uh, well, I don't have, the, like the Durham, uh, translation invariant part of this, you should get something which is very close to an EN algebra. Uh, so th there's the radius also problem, but uh, there are several results which are going in this direction. Anyway, what I want to talk about today is a discretized version of this. And uh, so I I'll state everything uh, so in dimension two, even though everything works in any dimension, it's just easier to draw pictures on the board. Um, so here is what I'm going to do. So we consider a square lattice in R2. And it's going to be oriented. So it's an infinite graph, if you want. Uh, and I'll give myself two vector spaces, H and V for horizontal and vertical. Um, so the element of the horizontal space will be labels on the horizontal arrow, arrows of, of my, my graph, and the vertical element of the vertical space will be decoration for uh, vertical arrows. So one way to, uh, and I'll give myself R, some matrix, so an endomorphism of H tensor V. And let me explain how to inter interpret this. So let's assume, like it's not necessary, but it's easier to, to explain how it is, uh, what it is about. So let's take some, so let's assume that H is and V are finite dimensional, and let's take a basis of this, so uh, like EI, for H and uh, FJ for V. So then the matrix R gets matrix elements. So it, it's some basis element EI tensor FJ. And like I'm not writing sums. So it's going to be RIJKL EK tensor FL. So here is how to, the way to interpret this. So we, we, we have configurations like this. So 
locally around the a vertex of our uh, of our lattice, we're having. So we'll decorate edges. So we'll decorate horizontal edges with E's and vertical edges with a F. So basis element of H and and V. And R. So the coefficient R I J K L is the weight associated with uh, this local configuration. Or if you, th if you want to think it in terms of probability, if you're counting things with probability, or IJKL is the probability that you have such a configuration uh, locally around the vertex. So, and the game we're going to play is to count configuration with weights. So like that's the state sum game. So here is a bunch of examples. So but before this I, I so I'm going to do some kind of state sum computation with boundary conditions. So I have to tell you how to deal with this boundary condition. So I'm going to have a space of boundary states so uh, let me take some so you will be some open bounded and even like just for simplicity I, I'm taking convex but it actually doesn't matter we can also even only take both I mean uh, any any basis of the, of the topology of R2 would work. Uh, so I'm, ta I'm taking such a thing. Uh, and so like I have my lattice here. And some. so U will be something like this. So I'm going to, going to have boundary edges. So like, let me write d plus h of u. These are going to be uh, the incoming, that's for the plus, horizontal, that's for the h, boundary edges. So that's the state set of such things. So what is it exactly? So that's an edge which is horizontal. That's pretty good what it is. And saying that it's, uh, it's incoming, it's just that E intersects U. And moreover, uh, the source of E does not belong to U. Basically, uh, like this is a horizontal incoming edge, for instance. And like, well, you can define like d minus h u for incoming, uh, outgoing, sorry, horizontal edges, and you also have d plus v u for vertical incoming edges, and d minus v u is going to be obvious as well. Okay. Uh, right. So. Now, we can say. So l let me observe that there's a canonical bijection between horizontal incoming edges and horizontal outgoing edges of you. That's pretty clear. I mean, like since the region is bounded, like if you enter into the region at some point along a line, you will go out of it at some point as well. So there's a canonical uh, there's a bijection uh, in a canonical one between this and as well with vertical ones so we can define uh, w of u that's going to be our space of boundary states uh, that is going to be endomorphisms of h tensored to the power uh, d plus h of u 
tensor v to the power d plus v of u. So what it means is that to every incoming horizontal edge, we associate an element of h. And then to every outgoing uh, horizontal edge, we associate an element of h dual and, uh, and, the, same. and the same for the vertical uh, uh, edges. OK. Um, so now we're ready to define the partition function. And the partition function associated with a given region u is going to be counting all possible configurations with weights with associated boundary condition. And the boundary condition will be some specific element in here. So here is how it works. Uh, and instead of giving you a formal definition, let me give you a bunch of examples. So first example, let me take this. So let's take u being this. Um, so I'll have decoration like, uh, so I'll have EI FJ FL, sorry, uh, EK FM FN. So all possible dec decorations will be this. So I'm going to construct, uh, so Z u will be an element of wu. So I, I write it as a map from k to w of u. And it sends 1, well, to the u1. And that is defined to be, uh, well, that's going to be an element of this. So it corresponds, so it, it will be like a basis of such a, an uh, of, of this space is given by tensor product of all these things. So I have to describe you a sum over all these things. So it's a sum over all the indices like i, j, k, l, m, n. And then what I'm going to do is to put the matrix R at every vertex and sum over all, like, or the only all remaining possibility is summing over all possible decorations in the, in the middle here. So now uh, I'm putting, so that's going to be sum over S, uh, and that's going to be R, I, J, M, S times R, S, uh, L, K, N. Actually, it's the better to put indices on the left, on the right, on the top, on the bottom. Than it will be. <laughs> Sorry? It's much better to put indices on the left, on the right, on the top, on the bottom, on the top. So yes. You you're right. Anyway, in the end, I'll, draw, I, I, I'll, I'll get out. I won't use this notation anymore. So you, uh, there's kind of a better notation for that. So. In tech, you can put uh, indices anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and times like this big thing, like e, e, I, tensor, E, whatever, K, uh, tensor, F, J, F, L, F, M, F, N. Yeah. So, yes, you're right. Uh, uh, there's a yeah. There's a star here. Uh, J L here. Okay. Anyway, so overall, what we're doing is just matrix multiplication, right? Here, summing over S and like taking the product of these two. If you can forget about all other indices, that's just matrix multiplication. And what we're doing is just matrix multiplication in two dimensions somehow. So what we're really, what is the image of one? That's this matrix. So let me like assign numbers to like every vector space. So that's one, two, and three. Uh, and like this is just R one, two. So that's not, this, this indices are not the same as these ones. So what, that's why I put a comma in here. So that just means R acting on the first two vector spaces and then acting by identity on the remaining one. And then I apply R, applying acting on 1, 3. So it acts on the first and the last guy. So it's an element in endomorphism of H tensor V, uh, tensor V, where these are, these are 1, 2, 3. OK? So more generally, I mean, you can write uh, matrix multiplication. Let me show you one more. 
just to resolve some ambiguity that can be in the notation. So if I'm taking like this bigger one, like z of u1 in this case. So let me number this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's going to be r23 for this first vertex here. Then r24 for this one, r25, and then r13, r14, r15. And you can observe that actually, uh, like these two ones actually do commute. So like the, the order in which we, we do things is not completely determined. But, but anyway, since things do act on different space, actually, there are some commutation relation that you have which like, kind of resolve this ambiguity. OK. Uh, but not only you can have this partition function, you have a, a kind of conditional version of this. So like we'll play with uh, u minus some uh, other open subsets u prime instead of just some this absolute version u minus like empty set. So here is how it works. Assume that you have a like u and we have a subset u prime in it. We're going to associate to this a map from w of u prime to w of u, a linear map. And here is how it works. Oh. Uh, and again, let me uh, give an example. So the bigger open subset will be this big U here, and the blue one will be U prime. So boundary states for U prime, that's going to be endomorphism of H tensor V square, and it goes to W of U, which is endomorphism of H to the third, V to the third. And basically, we're taking some A here. So A is an element that lives here. So somehow, we, we're being blind. We don't know what happened inside U prime. We only know what happened at the boundary of this domain. And we're counting all possible configuration given boundary condition on this domain inside. So basically, we're filling everything with R here. So like, again, if I number things like this, uh, it sends A to like this big matrix. Like we're going to have R3, 4, R3, 5, R3, 6, like for these three guys here. Then there will be A. So A acts on three different guys. So there are going to be A, 2, 4, 5. And then R26, and then the remaining Rs like R14, uh, 15, and 16. Anyway. And you can play this game uh, a lot. So, what we're interested in in the actually the what happens when U becomes bigger and bigger. So we're taking the uh, let me define formally w of r2 uh, to be the colimit for over all u's of w of u. And once you get some kind of the global section of this, you get an action of z mod 2, uh, of, of z square, sorry. Just because everything we did is completely translation invariant along the lattice. And the conjecture.
which I, I think is unpublished. Uh, I only heard you talking about this, but uh, in talks, but uh, I never seen something written about this, right? So uh, it's it's that if you're taking the chains for the group Z2 acting on this representation W of R2, that comes equipped with an action of the chains on the little Liskov rod. And again, I mean, I, I, I studied everything for in dimension two, but that's, that, that works in any, any dimension. So in class, uh, <coughs> these pictures you're drawing uh, yeah. are, remind me of these operator categories, like uh, Clark Barwick study. Do you know of any? There's not a connection that you know? I don't, uh, not that I know. It may be, but not that I know. Okay. This is kind of discrete version of TX and nothing else. Yeah. So, um, of an operator category and, uh, and uh, equivalence between some operator categories and EN algebras. And the uh, operator categories look at least vaguely like this discretized picture you're drawing. Okay, it, it might be, I'm not sure, okay. Uh, as far as I know, these operator categories are related to EN operators, is that correct? Yeah. But there are cells in higher dimensions. In this picture, we only have like vertices and, and arrows and no higher cells. I, I don't know if it's, maybe there's a way to, to understand this that way, but uh, I don't know. Um, okay, actually one remark is that instead of, if, if instead of including one open subset in another one, you include a bunch of open subsets which are pairwise disjoint, uh, you get that uh, W is actually a factorization algebra uh, on R2. It's actually a factorization algebra on the lattice, uh, and actually you can push forward it to, the, to R2 via the inclusion of the lattice, so that worked pretty well. And the first strategy to actually prove, try to prove this conjecture was, uh, I never succeeded to make it work, but uh, it's, to, it's very easy to, using this Z, Z2 action on, on this factorization algebra to show that it's equipped with some kind of uh, discretized Durham differential. And uh, like you can cook up a, a factorization algebra in complexes uh, that, that is not exactly locally constant, but you can kind of guess that it's somehow asymptotically locally constant. So that would prove that global section would, would be equipped with, a, with an E2 structure. But I, mean, I never succeeded to make this argument work. So uh, here I'm going to present a different strategy to prove it, which is actually more direct. So that, yeah. There's a kind of like block spin thing you could do, right? Yeah, th that's the kind of thing also I was trying to do. Uh, but block spin works pretty well in dimension one, also sometimes in dimension two. And, it, and furthermore, it works with spin. And uh, like when, when you have like, like the dimension of the vector space you have like really matters. Uh -huh. uh, and like if, if you don't have really spin system somehow, like you have, you st when, when you increase, like when you try to do some kind of renormalization, you have non-local effects. And I don't know how to deal with that. But it might just be my ignorance. I mean, uh, uh. But that's, that's, that was also one strategy. So in general, I mean, I, I would love to see a way to make these discrete things fit into some kind of BV formalism or like to work out the analog of what you and Kevin have done for these discrete theories, that would be great. But, uh, I don't know how it works. Okay, but anyway, like for this, the, like the main result with that we proved with Damien Leger is that uh, uh, like this conjecture is true. And uh, like the, the goal for the rest of the talk is to explain the strategy for the proof. Okay, so so first of all, 
I need some discrete version of the of of the of the category of little disks uh, in R2. So let me explain how it, uh, how this works. So um, I'm going to construct. So let me write this DD2 for discretized disks. And this is going to be a 2, 1 category. Uh, pretty much strict, actually, a really a strict 2, 1 category. So uh, it's a 2 category in which uh, two morphisms are actually invertible. Uh, yeah. So. <coughs> so objects of this category will be uh, finite disjoint unions of disks in R2, one morphisms um, there are generated by inclusion of configuration of disks in R2 into bigger configurations, plus translations using the Z2 the Z2 action. Okay, so typically. Um, uh, like <coughs> oh, that's bad. Sorry. <coughs> that's an example of a one morphism in this category. I think if you can assume that disk are sufficiently big, contains a lot of integer points, so you can see just pictures with integer points inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I'm not writing the lattice here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's correct. So like when disks are too small, uh, things which that, that, that actually happen, you don't care really. What you, I mean, uh, like it still makes sense, but, uh, but you, you don't I mean, In the end, we are taking some big colimits, and we won't see what happened at small scale. Uh, so that, that's, that's where, so of course, at every, wh what we ask is that at every single step, like we, we never end up being in a configuration where disks do overlap, right? So that, that's really important. Otherwise, like everything, we won't get any E2 structure. And then the two morphisms are like these discrete homotopies. So the two morphisms will be uh, completely generated by like you have a disk, you can translate it that way or that way, or th this way and that way, and we consider that there's a two isomorphisms between two isomorphisms between these. Okay. So um, actually, this category, this two-one category, happens to be uh, like uh, there's a braided monoidal structure or E2 monoidal structure on it. And instead of showing, uh, exhibiting the, the, an E2 structure, I will give you two compatible E1 structure on this category. And I'm sure you can guess what it is. I mean, there will be a vertical direction and a horizontal direction. So here is how, how it works. So we have like two partial orders on objects. So we're saying that A is smaller than B that way if B is at the right of A, like typically if you have, well, something like this, this is A and this is B, but also if they were like this. So B should be on the right. So their projection on the first axis should be disjoint and B should be on the right, right? 
And, and like the, you have a vertical order, I mean, uh, uh, like a smaller than b that way. Uh, we say this if a is below b. OK. And the two monadal structure are very easy to write. Um, we're going to use the action of Z2. So uh, the horizontal tensor product of uh, two guys will be the disjoint union of, B of A with B translated by, uh, like say, the vector M0, where M uh, is uh, the smallest integer. Uh, so that a is uh, to the left of a of b plus m zero, right? So, like, if if b is to the uh, left of a, you have to translate b to the right to make it disjoint from a and to the right of a. But if 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 b is actually very much on the right and far away, you have to take a negative m to put it very close to, to, to A. And the same for the horizontal structure, so for the vertical structure. It's going to be A disjunct union B plus 0N, where N is the smallest, so that A is below B plus 0N. OK. And you can check that this actually defines Strict monoidal structure. There's even, I mean, the higher coherences are completely trivial. It's a strict monoidal structure. Um, like the actual dilemma is that. No problem with empty collection? No, there's no, no, it's fine. Actually, I mean, the, the correct way to phrase this is to prove that there's a single object in, in two one categories. So actually, like this, there are many ways to, to write this, this, this monoidal structure. Uh, and this one makes some choice. I mean, you could move A instead of moving B, for instance. Uh, but there's a single object, which is more fundamental. And that's, that's one way of presenting this. But, uh, uh, so that th there's a better way to write this, but uh, this one is much more monetary. Um, yeah, so like these are strict. Uh, monoidal products, and moreover, they are compatible. But the compatibility, this one is only up to higher uh, isomorphisms. So the compatibility is up to homotopy. Even though in dimension two, I mean, there's no much room for homotopies, but uh, uh, and uh, like in higher dimension, it's, it makes much more sense to present this using. Uh, iterated single objects in, in categories. OK. So uh, like because these are monoidal products which are compatible, we have like two compatible E1 structure. So it shows that uh, this gets an E2 monoidal structure on this DD2-1 two, two category. So in particular, if we mod out by two isomorphism and we go to the homotopy category, it's going to be an actual braided monoidal category. So the consequence is that the homotopy category of DD2 is braided monoidal. And actually, the 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 braided model structure in this case is pretty easy to write. I mean, you have like two open subsets. You, you have like A disjoint union B plus some M0. Uh, that's, let's see, that's a bigger one. So that's A and B plus M0. Um, and like here, you want to go to B and A plus some 
m prime 0, it doesn't have to be the same m. Well, it shouldn't be the same m. And definitely, I mean, the, the way to go from one to another, well, it's to use this discrete path to go to put this on the, on the right, and then you might have to translate back again. And up to this kind of discrete homotopies, like if you want really, like that B goes over A when they turn around, there's only one way to do this. And that's going to be your, bra your braiding in your uh, category. So that actually, uh, in an ad hoc way, I, we could define uh, the, the braided model structure directly on the homotopy ca category. OK. Um, right, so in, let me say also in that in dimension 2, like working with DD2 or its homotopy category doesn't matter that much because they are actually equivalents. Uh, it's just like this fact that uh, I mean configuration spaces in dimension 2 are k pi 1. So in the end, I mean, there's no higher, actual higher homotopies. But in higher dimension, it's not, not anymore true. So uh, we should stick with this uh, DDN category. So yeah, maybe a remark. In dimension n, we have uh, like EN monoidal N1 category. Uh, and it's not equivalent to its somatopy category, while it is in dimension 2. Anyway, we'll see in the end that the, the specific examples that will solve the conjecture actually uh, factors for the homotopy category. Yes? That's for a refinement of the conjecture. So sort of the interesting thing is this, if you fix this R, right, that's kind of the model you're thinking. Yes. Do you know what the, the that's like a pointing um, <coughs> locally in this uh, W of U. What's the co-limit of, if I pick my R matrix, what's the co-limit of R? Like what, does, do you have a guess of what element and? So, so the, the, the co-limit of, w, what, what is WR2? Is that the question or? What is the R, what's the, what's the distinguished point in the co, in the co-limit? In W of R2, yeah. So many. This WR2, you want no, to no, describe no, this space? It's, it's not NLA, but a partition function kind of. Oh, that's just a huge product of R's. No, no, I understand that. No, no, so it's kind of a unit. Is it good to the unit? Or anything? Oh, you get some square goods, yeah. I mean, like, you, if you picked R to be 0, you'd always get 0. If you picked R to be identity, you'd always get identity in the. Yeah. As you did this thing. But if you pick interesting R's, which is picking an interesting vertex model, Yeah. do you have a sense of how to? Figure out. I, I assume this is like a change. Right, it's kind of like z, uh, I think it's uh, z uh, uh, n are operations n equals zero. Yeah, it should be unit. In, it will be infinite algebra unit, nothing else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gonna. But uh, but uh, like typically, if if you take the R matrix to be zero, in the end, this, this W uh, R two is going is going to be zero itself. Because the like you're taking a colimit for zero map. I mean, the colimit is going to be zero. So, in, and in general, if you take a non-invertible R matrix. I thought W is this, this vector in this vector space? Yes, yes. W R2 is a, is a vector space. Ah, you get vector space with the element, it will be unit for all kind of, it will be unit of e It's the unit in this E2. Algebra. Yeah, yeah, it's the unit of the E2 algebra. But w, w is the name of the space, right? Maybe that's where it would. Yeah, I think I'm a little bit, well, I'm interested, like, where the, the sort of interesting part of the physics is this is all like linear algebra. I want to yes. Know, yeah, happening. Yeah, with the the partition function. Yeah. So the partition function is the unit for the for the for the E and algebra that you're constructing. And then the interesting thing is if I start deforming it to see how that. So sorry, I didn't get. If I start deforming it somehow to see how it changes or something. This definition. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'll ask you. Yeah, I have to say that I I I I'm not sure I I, I can I can say what is the interest. Like, what's the actual physics content of this? But, uh, uh, no, this, no, this kind of formal deformation is zero, but it's like the normalization upside down. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, um, now the, the, the goal is like, like, let me make a small digression for why 
uh, like how we can produce Ian algebras from, from, from these categories. So uh, maybe like there's a general way of constructing Ian algebras uh, from let's say lax Ian monoidal functors. So th th there's this general principle that uh, like if you have C and D two Ian monoidal like infinity one categories. And let's get F um, a lax Ian monoidal functor. Then uh, the collimate of this functor um, uh, is an EN algebra in D. So one, one way, like which which is quite pedantic, but uh, which will be actually useful to reformulate this, is as follows. So, um, like we have we have this functor c equals to d. We have the terminal factor to the point category. And uh, actually, the collimate of f is just uh, a left can extension uh, uh, along this. So like the functor, like the, if, we, if we get the left can extension of f along this, this terminal morphism, uh, what we get is is the it's a functor which sends the like the unique object here to the collimate of f there, and uh, and like the yoga of can extensions works if if things are structured namely with uh, actions of operat. So uh, in this case, if f is n monoidal, I mean this functor is obviously n monoidal. This one will be uh, lax n monoidal, and uh, like I mean. An E N algebra in D, that's tautological, it's the exact same thing as an E N monoidal functor, a lax E N monoidal functor from the point to D. So that, that's a way of referring, I mean, that's a very pedantic way of saying what I said before. Just it's going to be useful for computing uh, collimates of functors in several steps. So let me actually uh, give an example of this, which is the one that we're interested in. So. So, um, assume that uh, C is this category of discretized disk. We get some functor F here. And assume that, let's say, D is any actually infinite one, monoidal infinite one category. But let's say it's complex, it's a category of complexes. So, like here, I have the functor to points. And I'm, I'm going to go to point in two steps. So first of all, I'm going to take the functor from DDN that goes to this category, which is essentially the classifying category of Z2. So it has one object. Its morphisms are just like uh, generated by Z2. Z2. You could put, uh, well, oh, that's, let's say ZN here. Because, and you could say that there are like homotopies, uh, like instead of, like things would commute strictly, that would commute up to homotopy, but actually these things are equivalent, so that doesn't matter. And then there's this here. So if you first compute, so when, when you compute collimates, there's a kind of Fubini theorem that tells you that, like, if you compute can extensions here, uh, like, you can compute it in two steps there. So first of all, you can compute the can extension with respect to this, morph this functor here. So what it does, like if you forget about the z in action, it's just this collimate when u gets bigger and bigger. And this is a filtered collimate. So taking either the collimate or the homotopy collimate, it doesn't matter. So in the end, what you get from here, uh, it's really uh, like f of r2 or rn. And this thing is just like 
getting an object in this with an action of the n. And then when you take the limit along this, that's just taking homotopy co-invariant for this with respect to this action. And uh, if you work with complexes, what you get is really chains for the zn action with values in this f of rn, right? So whenever you have a, an en monoidal functor from this discretized category, discreted disk category to, let's say, complexes, every time, so the, the upshot of this is that uh, chains in zn with values in f of rn, this is just another name for the colimit over all u's of f of u. This gets equipped with an action uh, of, an, of the en operator. Okay? So you're regarding complexes as like uh, infinity algebra? Yeah, yeah. So complexes, like this is an. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's the infinity one category of complexes. Yes. It's, a, it's, it's symmetric monoidal, also in particular, it's also en monoidal, yeah. Okay, um, so in the end, uh, the last thing to check is that we do have such a functor. And indeed, if you, if you look, uh, w, uh, is an example of an E2 monoidal functor uh, from DD2 to complexes. And it's even a strict E2 monoidal functor in the following sense that actually W does not depend on the higher homotopies. So, first of all, we have DD2. We can go to its homotopy category. Well, again, I'm doing things in dimension two, so in this case, they are equivalent, so it doesn't matter so much. But in higher dimension, actually, it, it does matter. But with this specific example, it factors through the homotopy category. So it's a nice one category. Uh, and like the W, the construction that we have with W actually land in vector spaces. And the construction is completely monoidal, strictly with the two monoidal products, the vertical and the horizontal one. Like W on a disjoint union of guys, you just declare that is the tensor product of W of each guys. And like all the computation we did is compatible with everything. And then you embed vector space into complexes as complexes concentrated in degree zero. So that's, that's a, an E2 monoidal functor. So in the end, it, it, it gives a proof of the conjecture that like chains uh, on WR2 gets it equipped with an E2 algebra structure. So maybe before I, I stop, I, I'll give you a few remarks. Um, so, so why exactly are you doing this for n equal to 2? No, I, that, that's just for, for, for exposition. It, it's just easier to to explain things, but it works for n equals whatever. Yeah, yeah for any n, it works. Um, like a bunch of remarks. The first one is that actually, if n is greater or equal to three, because like this specific example factors through the homotopy category, the homotopy category is symmetric monoidal, then because like en monoidal whatever. Uh, for n greater equal to 3, for strict 1 categories, that's just symmetric monoidal. Vector space is symmetric monoidal. So actually, this is a symmetric monoidal functor. So in this case, if n is greater or equal to 3, then, and that was actually something that I didn't expect that. We, we get that this en, this en algebra structure is actually an infinity algebra structure. Which was quite surprising to me. Um, sorry. Yeah, it is because there's basically no room for homotopies uh, in this specific case. Like because, of course, if you take a an 
H and V being complexes, and R being some kind of fundamentalism of this H tensor V as complexes, then there will uh, it, it won't be true. But uh, but if your H and V are concentrated in degree zero, like there's no room for higher homotopies actually for for the for the commutativity, and it will be infinity. Um, so li like the question, I, I'd, I'd like to see an example and a natural example where in higher dimension, like this, this would produce something which is not an infinity, but E3 or whatever. Um, maybe like, I don't know, uh, other question I have is that if the R matrix has special properties, uh, like let's say, Let's say assume it satisfies the quantum young baxter equation. I, I have like, uh, what does it imply in terms of this E2 algebra structure? I actually have no idea. And also, I would be very much interested in other examples like uh, maybe non-topological ones or, or something like typ typically uh, examples I would like to understand very well, very much, but I, I, I didn't get any success up to now, is that if you have like a half space and uh, like you have, you take the hyperbolic metric and you, you have a kind of graph which is with the geodesic, that, that there, there are ways to write kind of discrete models for this. And can we get some kind of Swiss cheese algebra or things like this? Okay, uh, lots of questions, but uh, like for the moment, no, not many answers. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah? remarks. Yeah. yeah, there was also some similar, at first I don't believe it's an equal so <laughs> uh, 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 And uh, second, there was kind of similar trouble with inductive limits and uh, similar stuff. In, it, at some point, there is Jan Söberon wrote a paper about some Pukai categories. And we didn't want to do to, to do go to foundations, and we kind of moved by some flaw Lagrangian, so they intersect transversely. And if they not intersect transversely, we don't just do not define anything to uh, product it. Okay. Only some kind of and so it was kind of axiomatic partially defined infinity thing with some flaws, and then you think of proved somehow that it's equivalent to infinity algebra. Uh, at the end of the day, I forgot what the terminology we used. And my my feeling it's kind of similar uh, uh, trouble even even in dimension one. Then one makes sense here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And second thing which I want to say that I realize that the few young generation probably don't know because I didn't really read uh by Kevin, I have to say. Uh, there is a kind of uh, for example this question about uh, deformation of QFT, yeah? yeah. Uh, when it's not free, yeah, but we start with like conform field pseudo anything. I uh, have for many years, I have announced, and maybe I can share with it's really one line yeah, sure. formula. Yeah, sure. Because I was never able to write it in proper paper. I think it's just, uh, just a formula. It was completely forgotten. Yeah, so uh, suppose we get, let's uh, just get some space time manifold. Uh, on which we have Euclidean theory, and midget for each point we get some vector space, and for uh, if we get f i, c t b of x i, the collection of points we get correlated. Yeah. And, okay, and then we get some op for these guys, and, and this space is kind of featured. It's union of v x by. Uh, Dimensions. Sure. Yeah. Now, uh, suppose we have, uh, yeah, so it's mentioned that sync is given by final integral, it's integral of exponent of some action, electronic uh, components. Yeah. That was roughly the meaning of the story. But uh, now, now final integrals get conformed to the theory. And now I'm going to deform action, to replace action by action plus. And that's a small, small parameter, delta s, and delta s will be integral of Lagrangian, yeah? Uh, it will be integral of certain field Lagrangian that affects d, dx. And x, and dimension, dn. 
you get kind of top uh, form is with uh, values and fields will be a bot uh, end of this complex of co chains or mm -hmm. shifts and so on. Now I want to write new correlators. And the formula is kind of magic formula is the following. So this is n fields. The formula will be series in, in a bar. It should be the usual stuff plus some correction. What the correct formula? Sum of all n greater than zero. The one when factorial so h bar bar n. Then we make the integral of what? x. Uh, ah. I want to make integral. Of, uh, maybe we want to have to make integral of a correlation function product of f i x i. And product of Lagrangian on point by j, we want to capital N, d, 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 n, Lagrange, d, n, d, d, n, n. This, this will be what, what maybe we should take this integral. This integral is divergent, yeah? Yeah. Now, now what we do? We integrate over, we make kind of integrated six. First, we suppose we have fix all points except what, uh, y n and the generic. We integrate over y n, which are on degree some distance epsilon n for x i and all previous. Then, if the guys can't uh, compact, I don't consider it for us things, you get convergent integral. You remove the small balls. It depends on epsilon n. Now, we take limit, and by limit, I'll take Take a constant term on synthetic expansion, which says the sum R's logarithm, it's just it's a constant term. This will be limiting uh, parentheses. So you get function of the rest, you integrate all previous points in the future, future bit, and the claim it will be the formula for the perturbed theory. And it depends on choice of the things, and if you change the metric, you get homotopy and stuff. And how would you get the e n structure? Oh, no, no, it's not the end. If you have log it to an epsilon, then the constant term is no. You remove, remove. It's a constant term. It's, it's not. It's not. It's not uh, in, invariant uh, by, by relation six. Mm. But it's kind of well, if, if it depends on the definition what is limit. It's through some fu linear functional functions which have continuous limit should get the limit to zero. Any linear functional, okay, and um, it will be some kind of choice of, of formal coordinates in the neighborhood of quantum field theory. And if you choose. A different limit you get identification for it. And then one can extend to EN algebra things are just plain deformation theory. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments? Question? I, I had two other questions. One one thing you can do is replace vect by some other interesting, even like say a Bradymanoidal category or something in a certain setting. Or, or just think like G vect or G of yeah. group or something. Um, do you, have you thought about? No, I, like, I'm kind of lacking examples. Like, I don't know, uh, and I would not like to consider kind of fake examples. I would be interested in, like, this, this models with R, I mean, they, they naturally show up in, uh, in statistical mechanics. Uh, I would be interested in seeing, like, exa yeah, examples that show up naturally in. Uh, I, I mean, there are these lattice theories that are supposed to correspond to the sort of three TFTs we learn in math. Yeah. Right? I mean, have you tried those? No, no, no. Uh, well, like with Giovanni Felder, we we had a we, we have a different different approach to uh, lattice gauge theory in dimension two, and like we recovered basically the Migdal Witten renormalization and stuff for for this this Younger theory in dimension two, but it, like it's completely independent of the shape of the lattice. While here, I mean, we, because of the Z two action, we have to have a square lattice, for instance. Um, yeah, there are also questions like uh, instead of vertex model, there's well, these models that we, I think we've seen them uh, this morning. What, what I call IREF model, interaction around a face. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it's still the same. I think it. You put tensors with add more indices, but put a lot of zeros in the tensors and get the same stuff. The other thing is, does D2, I, I just don't remember, does it have like sort of an empty set in there?
Yes, yes. Is that where the matrix R is being hidden? Yeah, so, so like the map from empty guy to, to any open subset, that's going to be putting R's everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Great. So that, yeah, that's the partition function, basically. Right, so, so the, the color of like the, the W part, ignoring the R, is easy to compute, but like where, so you get some big, you get some E2 algebra, but you could think about it being sort of the same thing for every trace of R, but the, the image of R on the colon is sort of moving around, right? Do you, like the W part's just this big colon of endomorphisms of some big vector space. Yeah. No, but uh, like, no, no, R, it's going to be uh, a, a huge product of R's. It's not going to be one single R. I understand that. The, but the, 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 the big, the E2 algebra, so the underlying chain complex, yeah. in this case, is vector space, doesn't change as you change R, right? No, no, that's, that's true. So what I'm asking is, is, as I vary R, do you know how that changes inside of there? If I change R on just the single vertex, how that changes? But I thought in the colon, yeah. you take R and uh, as yeah. the map yeah. on all the vector spaces, yeah. right? So if you change, I mean, the colon, the shape of the colon, I just don't change, have any R, what this colon looks like, sort of concretely. The, the, like, like if R is invertible and if R is zero, you get a very different colon. I agree. No, yeah. No, so. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, okay. Interested. This this uh, this thing is filtered by by pieces uh, by kind of like radius of domain. Sure. And uh, the growth like a, a, a dimensional. Uh, Filter component goes to the exponent of uh, uh, size times dimension minus one. Yeah. Yeah. And in uh, conform field theory, in, in, uh, you, you can see filtered by uh, dimensions, it's the same growth. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, oh, I can see the, the volume of the volume of the ball, that volume of the ball to the power of n over uh, whatever, d over d, uh, d minus one over d. Yeah. And like in conform field theory, things go to like exponent of square root of. Energy, yeah. So it's a similar story, just inductively. In, in, in quantum field theory, go to small, small balls, mm -hmm. and here go to large. Yeah, you will get. Yeah. Okay. So I found a two torus. What do you get? You should be able to give me like a, a tell me a, a vector space, and as I vary the R matrix, like I get a different set of numbers. What will take two? No, I, like I, I'm, I'm pretty far from being able to compute invariance of, of like surfaces just from this. Yeah, no, but also I just want to say that it's uh, these things could be zero and zero should be there are universal Turing machines which can put on this already in two dimensions, the style tiles, and this thing is kind of algorithmic or non recognizable. Yeah, so the growth could be <coughs> very, very slow and